Good morning, everyone. All right, thanks for getting up early uh, for my talk. I know it's hard. Um, I am James Long, uh, not the fashion designer in London, which is what Google will try to, try to tell you I am. Um, I work for Mozilla on the Firefox DevTools, and um, we've done a lot in the last few years. We've been moving really, really fast, um, but the problem is when you do that, you usually accumulate a lot of technical debt, um, especially on our front end. We pretty much um, just haven't had a whole lot of time um, to think about more innovative and uh, cool ways that we can do our UI, um, and not really just cool, but things that actually uh, solve very big problems. Um, so right now, we're doing a lot of things that just make things harder. So we've been talking a lot about what we can do about this. Um, and uh, specifically, of course, I've been thinking about how we can use React. Um, so I've been talking to my team about that. But it's really, really hard when you already have this big project um, because refactoring sucks. Uh, it's a lot of work for very little short-term gain. Um, you're having to replace a lot of code uh, without adding anything new. Um, and for if some people don't believe in what you're trying to do uh, or don't actually see a whole lot of value in the, the things that you're adding, it's you're just wasting time. Um, and you, know, you, you may actually just do the wrong thing until you are just wasting time. Uh, I mean, just imagining updating all of your tests, it's just a very hard problem. Um, additionally, you still need to be shipping features while you're refactoring. That's probably the hardest thing about refactoring is that you can't just pause the world and stop development for six months. Um, so in that way, it's kind of like changing the wheel of a moving car. Uh, and actually, this GIF makes it look awesome. Uh, if only refactoring were this awesome, because that is ridiculous. They're actually replacing two wheels at the same time. Uh, you know, it's actually more like this. Uh, it feels good at first. Um, you're cleaning things up, and you're like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to solve all these requirements. Uh, and then it just goes to shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, it's also hard, because it's tempting to look at something like this and think, wow, this looks really bad. We need to clean this up. Uh, but what you actually forgot is that this is actually an elegant solution given, this, given the actual requirements. The requirements were naturally complex in this case. This, this highway need, needed to connect all of these roads, and this is actually very well designed um, if you understand the problem. And so it's easy to look at code and think uh, that looks bad, but sometimes, sometimes it naturally is just complex. So refactoring is really hard because you have to figure out which wheel to replace um, and additionally what to even replace it with because you need to come out better on the other end after you've been refactoring. Um, so you, you, you'll lose all of these nuances and edge cases that you've already solved. So we, we, can't, we can't lose those. So we have to figure out a way. How can we get rid of all these problems that we have and use something like React? but still kind of keep the essence of what we have. So there's this idea of inherent versus incidental complexity. I'm sure all of you all have heard this, um, but you, you need to kind of sort of learn again uh, which, which parts of your code base is just built up incidental complexity. Either it's things that were solving requirements that aren't actually requirements anymore, um, or it's just bad code, um, and try to remove those as, as much as possible. So think hard about what you really need because every abstraction has a cost. Um, so I think you should be very ruthless about only adopting abstractions that you actually get benefits from. Because um, otherwise, you'll, you'll still pay the cost of the abstraction. Uh, but if, you, if you're only getting little benefit from it, then uh, it's probably a net negative of the complexity that that is adding to the system. Um, and this is, you know, over time, your requirements change. And so maybe an abstraction that you actually were getting benefits from, you, you're not getting it anymore, and you just sort of have to put up with it. Um, I mean, for example, uh, you know, some, some people may like promises. Um, promises, for example, uh, it's an abstraction. It, it's an abstraction over async uh, work. Um, and it's a good way to do async values. Um, and, it, and it has things like error propagation, which is nice. Uh, but it also tends to make errors silent, because they just eat errors. It just eats all your errors, because it has to, because of the way that it's meant to work. Um, and so, but if you forget to attach an error handler or your tool chain isn't connected the right way, your test may be failing and you have no idea. This actually happens to us. Um, and additionally, the semantics are just sort of confusing. So there's a high, there's a, there is a high cost to promises. Um, there's also high value if you actually need them, but you may not actually need them as much as you think. 
So when trying to migrate existing code especially, only add as little new abstraction as possible. Don't just jump to this whole entire new stack or this new framework. Um, I think you should leave room to grow in the future and uh, that's why I tend to prefer things like libraries over frameworks because you can sort of incrementally adopt uh, what you need um, and in the end you only, uh, after you've migrated, you know, maybe it takes six months, maybe it takes two years, uh, what you are left with are just the things that you need um, and I think that's super valuable. Because um, you, again, you really want to come out better on the other end after you have been doing the refactoring. So, you know, bad abstraction sort of can feel like this. I mean, that may be some really nice wood that, that those balls are rolling down, uh, but you just want to turn on the light. That's all you want to do. Um, you don't need the whole framework, you just want to turn on the light. Uh, so what we want to get to is this, where it's a very, um, as a well-oiled machine, um, every single piece has a purpose. So how do we do that? If you're already stuck with the Rube Goldberg machine, how do you get to this? Uh, you know, and I think uh, you just start simple. Um, you can start migrating pieces of your app, pieces of your code slowly into a new architecture, um, which is ideally sort of simple at first. Um, and as, as you do that, you relearn your requirements. And so as you're migrating things over, you can see things that are like, I don't even need that anymore. I'm just gonna, um, uh, which is another reason why it's important to start simple, because if you, um, if, as you start simple, you can add things back to it. So again, um, you can build, build it back up slowly as you're migrating pieces and pieces over. So this is a very long process, right? I mean, um, because we can't, we can't just do a total rewrite. We can't just ditch a lot of our code because we've already built up business logic, which actually is uh, solving some complex cases, which is naturally complex. Okay. So when I'm looking for abstractions, when I'm looking at different libraries and frameworks, I have a couple core principles that I like to think about. Um, I think that it must be composable. Is it easy to reuse? Can I use it wherever I want? It must be testable. Can I load a single module and test it independently else outside of the system? Uh, can I replay what happened? Can I send it off to somebody else? Um, it must be, must be debuggable. Um, like, can I actually do the replaying functionality? Um, and it must be live reloadable. Can I change code and it just magically appears in the app? Now, this seems just like a fun feature, but this is actually what I think should be core to development. And I come from a deep Lisp background, so this is, a, this is very embedded into me. Uh, I think live reloading is a super important um, uh, feature for development. I mean, when I see developers doing um, code that is in an architecture where live reloading works really well, um, it's a huge, huge boost to um, our productivity. Now, all of, the, all of these things actually have one thing in common. It really could come down to just this one question. Is it stateful? Um, because if it, if it is internally managing its own state, um, then it sort of violates all of those principles. It's hard to test it. We can't get to that state if we want to. We can't live reload it because you want state to persist across live reloads. Um, you can't debug it because you can't look at the state. Um, so, for, for example, this is a typical JavaScript pattern. You know, this is sort of how we use the classes, and of course there's now ES6 classes, which isn't a whole lot different. We construct a user, uh, we have a method on the user, is scary, um, and we construct a user. I'm not scary, because I have two eyes. Uh, what is the first thing that we do here? We mutate the object. We mutate ourselves. Um, so this pattern encourages mutation, uh, which is just really, really bad. Um, because it's, it's very hard to track what is going on in the entire system when you have a big complex app and you have things mutating themselves in internal state everywhere. It's very, very hard to grasp what's going on. Um, it's a lot simpler if we just do, do something like this. We just have a function that is scary. It takes some data and then it does some work on the data. And then it just constructs an object uh, which represents the user. Now, you, you may want to um, have something like a constructor, like make user, um, so that, you know, probably is gonna do some more complex things, but here we don't need that, right? Again, just keep it simple if it should be simple. Um, and what's nice about this is now, now that the data is extracted from the, um, from the function, they're just two separate things. You can do simple things like, hey, let's, let's wrap it into an immutable object. Let's, let's uh, use a completely different implementation of the data structure. Um, and there, there are sort of ways to um, uh, use sort of like a protocol so that it's exposing the data in a similar manner, um, using like getters and, and things like that. But you can use an entirely different data implementation if, the, if you have uh, more explicit data in your, um, throughout your app. And you know, this is just a method, right? We can just live reload this method. We can just switch it out for a different 
implementation. Because uh, it's just a method, we can just redefine it. These sorts of things get a whole lot more complex when you start doing a lot of like classes and wrapping things into themselves. Okay, so I mean, is this actually possible though? Is it possible to build a real world complex apps with just pure functions and data? Um, it seems like that's gonna break down at some point. Uh, but the thing that I love about React and the React community um, is that they've really proven that this, uh, you could do this. You can do this for a lot of your app. Um, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't ever use classes. Uh, you can use them in certain cases um, at certain points in your app. Uh, but for the general architecture of your app, you shouldn't require that. It shouldn't be the API that you need. Um, so let's just, let's just run with this. Let's see how far we can take this. Let's see uh, what we can do with this. So let's, let's talk about fr um, front-end development. What we need, what comes to my mind when I think of what I need for front-end development is we need to render the UI, we need to manage state, we need to do asynchronous work, and uh, we need to test it. Um, and so where we are with the dev tools is we uh, do manual DOM mutations for the UI, which is really hard to just keep track of. It's especially hard to create new things because we, it's hard to compose uh, these sort of mutations um, we have state in the DOM. Uh, we have custom JS classes, which maintain their state. Um, so state is sort of spread out everywhere, um, and it's especially bad that there is state in the DOM because you're now dependent on the DOM for stuff. Um, so it's very hard to rationalize about where state is. Um, there's promises and events everywhere, uh, like all throughout the UI, um, and it, it feels like a good idea, um, but I think it, again, just kind of makes some things harder. Um, and there are very few unit tests for our UI, and that's the sad thing. So it sort of feels like this, once you, you have this kind of architecture. You can lay, lay this out as cleanly and nicely as you want, and everything is nicely exposing your promise interface and internally managing its own state so that you don't have to care about it. But you still, at, a, at, a, at an overview, you have no idea what's really going on, going on in the system. To do anything here, you have to be intricately aware of actually every single little piece in the system. Um, so where we want to go is we, we want to have a declarative UI, uh, central app state, um, do a, a async work in an explicit manner where there's atomic UI updates, um, and have a lot more unit testing. Um, so if only there was a library that would allow us to do declarative UI work. Uh, yeah, of course that's React. Um, so that gives us components and declarative UI, and there's not even any DOM needed. We can do unit testing with like React components. I don't think I need to explain React at all if you're at this conference. Um, so there's, there's a complementary library called Redux, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, um, and it provides a way to manage the state. It's things that sort of are outside React's um, role. And Redux provides a central app state um, and flux style actions and um, these things called action creators. So Redux is a great way to sort of, that complements React um, by encouraging um, the, um, concepts like a central app state. So if you, if you think back to that diagram of that board, um, think about now, you know, React and Redux are sort of the CPU and the GPU. It's a lot more um, bigger, there's much more a, of a coarse architecture where you have the central app state and a uh, declarative UI, and there, it's easier to see how things pump through the system. Okay, so let's, let's start very simple with this. We have our declarative UI, right? So, Think of this UI, this very simple green box as a very complex React component tree. Uh, we don't really care how it's implemented. Data comes in and it renders the UI, and then the UI can fire events. Um, so for example, this would be our, our declarative UI. It's just a function. It's just a, it's just a function that takes some properties. We get the items off the properties, and we return um, a list of all of the items. That's just, it's just a pure function. It's great. All right, so what about data, though? Um, the, uh, so for the data, what Redux encourages you, you to do, which comes from ClojureScript and some from Elm as well, is to have just a single JavaScript object. So this, this state object is just a single JavaScript object. This has some items of some names. And of course, in a real world app, this would be far more complex and a deep, deeply nested data structure, but the core thing is, is that it's just a single object. Um, and uh, so, okay, so that's cool. So what about events, though? What, what is that gonna do? How, how do we do events? Uh, so Redux defines these things called action creators, and this actually sort of comes from the Flux world. Um, I mean, this, this is the core idea of Flux, uh, which was a good idea. Um, and action creators are just functions. So they're just functions. This is a, an action creator, function add item. 
and they create actions, and they dispatch actions to the state. So dispatch is this action. Uh, the action is just a, a dumb JavaScript object with a type field. Uh, so the action creators are just methods that create actions that are dispatched to the state. And then the, um, we define update functions, which take state and take an action and return new state. So that's another core idea here as well, is you never actually mutate your state. You always return new state. And that allows a, um, a lot of fantastic, um, fantastic things. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That is the core idea of Redux and React and the combination of the two. So you have this very simple flow um, where you have state, the state changes. Whenever the state changes, um, the UI is re-rendered, and then the UI can call methods, which are action creators, which dispatch actions to the state. So this is very circular flow. And, but even just with this simple architecture, by organizing it in this way, we're able to do very cool things, like state snapshotting. So this is my blog, which I wrote in React and Redux. I have a bunch of state, I have some fields, and I'm gonna be changing those, those fields. I'm just gonna change um, some of them. And then I'm gonna press a keystroke and get the entire app state serialized and just copy it, go somewhere else to a totally different URL, pull up that prompt again, and just paste in that, that serialized app state, and it's just gonna load up what represented that app state. So this didn't change the URL or go to a different page at all. This is literally just pulling up what represented that app state. So just by organizing it in that, in that way where there's a central app state, we can easily just snapshot the app, which is great for debugging. We can additionally do things like log and replay actions. So we, remember, action creators will fire these actions which update the state. That is the only way to update the state. What that means is that we can just log the actions which, an entire, which describe everything that has happened in the system. So this is the debugger uh, using Redux. Um, I'm making some changes in the UI, and Redux actually has this great project called the Redux DevTools. So I'm gonna pull open the DevTools, and these are all of the actions, these are all of the state changes that have happened in the UI that represent every single change. I can even inspect the action, what, prop, what parameters did it have, and I can inspect the state at that point in time, which is very cool, it's, it's very enlightening. And not only that, but I can replay all of the actions. So I loaded up the initial state, and I'm replaying all of the actions, so I can l actually watch how the UI changed over time. And I could do this from anywhere. I could have a user just um, send me their state and their actions um, and just replay what happened. Now, these are somewhat gimmicky. Yes, you always see these things at conferences, uh, and you hardly ever use them in real life, right? Um, it, it's helpful every now and then. It's helpful you know, when it, you have a, a really hard bug. But the, the action logging is super critical because it, it allows you to have um, insights into what is going on in your app. It's just like a, um, you always have to go in and add console.logs whenever you want to actually see what's going on, right? I mean, you, hopefully you use the debugger as well. But console.logging is actually a very powerful way of debugging. But this, now that we have made everything into first class actions uh, to represent changes in the system, we can uh, build that in naturally and just always log the actions when you're in debug mode and that way you can always see what's going on. And I use that almost every single day. Uh, okay, so we have that, that simple system. What about asynchronous work? This is something very important that I wanna talk about because this is where everything tends to get really complex. So this is where um, simple architectures tend to just either fall um, and fail or uh, just get super complex. So how do we do that? We have a simple system, uh, but where does, where, what if you wanted to fetch something from the server? Where does that fit, where does that fit into this? So you, you, if you remember those action creators, they're functions, right, that create actions. So it dispatches an action at some point in time. Um, action creators can actually dispatch multiple actions. Uh, so you can dispatch an action that represents the start of the request, and then you can action, uh, later in, in the time when the response is received from the server, you can dispatch another action that represents the finished um, state of, of, the, of the whole request. So this start and finish, uh, if you always do this in an action creator, you can do async work. So the, finish, uh, the finishing action will have the actual response, will actually have the thing that was returned from the server. But this allows you to do things like optimistic updating, and, or if you just wanted to show like a loading screen, uh, you could respond to the start state. Um, and so you, know, you could have any number of async work things going on, firing actions into the system, but it all happens sequentially throughout the UI. So everybody says that UIs are inherently asynchronous, 
And I actually sort of disagree with that, or at least I disagree with the, the general, how a lot of people receive that. Because, you know, this entire box right here is totally synchronous, as it should be. When you update the state, or when you fire an action, the updating the state and updating the UI happens exactly in that same function stack, it happens in that same tick. So um, this, the UI itself is actually synchronous, but we have this, this async work sort of going on outside this box. How we interact with UIs is as asynchronous. So everything outside of this box is sort of the land of Mordor, which is all this stateful stuff going on. Within this box, it's nice and little pretty pure, func pure, pure functions. If you know Elm, you know, you know this probably is resonating with you very much. I actually, in some twisted way, like to think about, about this as like, this is, this is the, the, the pure benefits of Elm inside the box. This is where we can say pure functions. Um, what, what Elm does is you actually will pass side, of, um, pass side effects up because all functions are pure in Elm. You pass it up to the runtime, and the runtime will actually do the async work for you. So I, kind of, I sort of like to think of this as a dumb way of getting some of those benefits where we, we uh, force everything async into action creators and they, they live just at a specific layer that's outside of our box. Um, and so that's how, you, that's, how, that's how you do asynchronous work in Redux is async um, action creators can just fire multiple actions. And you, they could be anything. You could use promises here, you could use observables or channels, you could use any async abstraction you want in the action creator if you want to do some complex sort of coordination. Um, and that to me is really nice because these have benefits. I'm not against promises um, entirely. Uh, I'm not against observables entirely. Um, I think that they do have a lot of cost um, and it's only, it's only worth using if you're actually needing the benefits that they provide. Um, but here we can use them when we need them, but when you need to actually interact with the UI and the whole system, um, you don't need observables throughout your UI. Uh, and so it's nice to have just this simple system of pure functions. And we could even think about replacing that entire UI layer with Relayer Falkor. It's sort of fantastic, te fantastic technologies. Um, and it's not, so again, it's, it feels nice to sort of uh, force everything async to be at this specific layer and model it a certain way um, because maybe at some point down the road, if we're um, able to do this, we could just look at Falcor or something like that, which is super cool, and just get rid of this. Because this is all just plumbing, right? Async work is entirely just plumbing. You're just getting stuff from the server and you're wanting to update that central state object. But really, in Falcor, could just automatically update that central state object and then you just still work on your UI that automatically renders it. Okay, so let's look at a little bit of code. Um, so this is how you dispatch an action. This is what would be in an action creator. Uh, we just call it dispatch and then we uh, create the the action, an action is just a JavaScript object with a type field and then some, some parameters. Um, what's nice about this, uh, again, just to reinforce this, is that this is entirely synchronous. The UI is updated once this function is done executing. On the next line, uh, the state has changed and the UI has re-rendered. So it's, it's, completely, it's a completely synchronous um, uh, way of working. So this is a more complex action creator. This would be an async action creator. Uh, we actually return a function that takes a dispatch function. Um, this is actually done through middleware. Middleware allows you to um, take um, anything returned from action creators and transform it into something else. So there's a thunk middleware, which allows you to return a function, and it allows you to hook into the dispatch system. So we're not dependent on some global dispatcher or some global dispatch crazy thing that we're um, trying to hook into. We just return a function that accepts a dispatch function, and then within that function, we can call dispatch now. And that means that we can call dispatch multiple times. So we call dispatch, uh, let's add the item with a status of start, which is the start of the request. And then we, you know, I do a set timeout um, to represent an async request. And then later on, we do a finish. And so we dispatch a finish. So there's multiple things going throughout the system. Um, and, you know, you don't want to do that for everything, because I didn't even talk about errors. Uh, you know, you would want to actually have to check the error status of the response and make sure to dispatch in, uh, in a, a status of error of the async action. Um, so again, with the middleware, we can actually wrap this up into something nice. You can, uh, we've written something called a promise middleware. This allows you to return an action, which has a, uh, it defines the type and then it defines the parameters, but it has a special promise field on it. And what uh, the promise middleware does is it takes this and it transforms it into multiple actions automatically. So a start action, a um, finish action, and, a, and an error action will all fire at the right time. 
So now we have this really nice system to sort of take those async abstractions and splice them onto our uh, synchronous async, or um, sorry, synchronous um, action dispatching system. Um, it might feel a little weird, like why don't we just take promises and just use them? Uh, but it's, again, it's the whole concept of let's just use pure functions as much as we can. Um, and doing this, I found, is really nice because it also allows us to use any async abstraction as we want. If we only accepted promises or only use promises as our interface, we could never use observables. If we only, you don't want to just depend on a single abstraction uh, throughout your entire app because otherwise you can't mix and match them as you need. So you might not need promises and observables or other async abstractions or channels because um, they all incur pretty big costs. Again, promises, they eat your errors. I mean, that to me is, is the biggest fail of promises. Um, and uh, they also tend to, um, promises will run your code over several ticks, and so promises tend to be, um, if you're using promises throughout your UI, um, it tends to introduce race conditions, um, and that's something that we've had a problem with. Um, so uh, you, I, I think at the core of your UI, um, that's I think the brilliant thing about React is that they have just a synchronous render function. Um, so you might not need some of these things, um, only need them if you're actually needing to do some uh, special coordination of async work. Okay, so I talked about needing rendering the UI, uh, ma managing state, and doing asynchronous work uh, when, when we're doing front-end stuff. The last thing that I thought about is that we need is testing, right? Um, a lot of things also comes out of this architecture of just using pure functions and data. Uh, it becomes a lot simpler to test. State updates, the, the update functions which take state, take an action, return a new state, uh, they're just functions, right? So you can just call them with any state that you want to and an action that you want to and just check that the return state is what you would expect. It's just a function. I mean, you don't need to do anything else. React components are basically just simple functions as well. They might have some other special lifecycle methods. Uh, but in general, you can just pass uh, some properties to a React component make sure that the JSON structure that, has re that it rendered to is, is, is correct. You don't even need the DOM. You can just unit test every single React component in the way that you want to. Um, it's super simple. Using pure functions is just awesome. Um, action creators are a little more complex. They're still generally simple functions that are generally pure um, in the fact that they don't depend on some global state in your app but they're still stateful because they're async. They're, they tend to be async, so they're a little harder. Uh, but if you, if you know how to test um, async work, then you can still do this. And it, action creators might need a little bit more weird things like needing to mock some APIs. Um, so action creators are a little hard, um, but it's a lot better than your whole app being really hard. So there are some other interesting ideas um, now that we have this architecture, now that we have this kind of observable um, changes in the system through actions. Like we could record a workflow. Um, I could start recording. I could like make some changes in the UI and say and um, make sure that I get to a certain point in time. And then I could save that whole session as a test and say run through all of these ac or given this initial state, run through all of these actions and uh, make sure that the state is what it should be at that point in time. Or maybe it just shouldn't error. Maybe it should actually just make sure that it successfully runs through that session at the right time. So I'm not sure, it could be a cool idea. Another um, probably more interesting idea is generative and property-based testing. This is super, super cool stuff. Um, it's basically just generates random input and will uh, just make, and it just dumps random input into your function. And property-based testing allows you to make sure that the output is correct. So you can actually, for UIs, you might say if a checkbox is checked and this other thing is selected. So I played around with this. Um, so I, I wrote um, some code using the gen test library that generates app states. So this is, this is what it looks like to generate app states um, and dump them into the UI. So this is just literally creating as many UIs as, as we can using any random data. Um, what's interesting about this is, I mean, this is sort of more of a fuzzer, right? This isn't doing property-based testing, but you could easily do, um, this is just kind of a fun hack for me. I didn't, um, you could easily extend this to do either property-based testing or you could be dynamically creating um, actions. Okay, so the core principles are, must be composable, testable, debuggable, and library loadable. Uh, it's very, very solved using just simple functions as much as possible um, and a single, single essential app state. So the Firefox is actually having a release today. You should go download it. Um, 
one of the things new in Nightly that we just built is a memory tool. So this allows you to show all of your memory where it's allocated, what is taking up the most space. This is all written in React and Redux. So this was our first prototype into actually using it completely, not just migrating single code. Um, I can't take credit for this. Actually, my teammate Jordan and Nick Fitzgerald and other people um, actually did some fantastic work for this. So we're slowly, slowly doing, doing this. We have a lot of code. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be anytime soon using all like React and Redux, but we're very close. But if you're interested in contributing, we're all open source, of course, um, so contact me. It's a little awkward right now because we're, we are trying to figure out this very um, hard migration phase, um, but there might be things that we can find if you're just interested in doing React stuff. Um, but I think in a couple months we'll be in a really good place to take React um, and Redux contributions. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>